Good morning and welcome to AEI in today's events. Will digital currencies and fintech shape the financial system of tomorrow? I'm Paul Kupiak, I'm a senior fellow at AEI and the moderator of today's event. Digital currencies and fintech. These two terms are used to describe an enormous range of financial activities, some of which have created challenging issues for policymakers. Bitcoin, the original and perhaps most famous cryptocurrency has fallen from its recent high of $67,000 in late November to about $36,400 this morning. Its total capitalization is about $687 billion. ETH, the cryptocurrency that trades on the Ethereum blockchain, fell from a high of $4,816 in mid-November to $2,384 this morning. Its market cap is about $283 billion. Today, even after recent losses, the combined value of these two cryptocurrencies alone is almost half the value of the $2.2 trillion of outstanding Federal Reserve notes. Libra, subsequently renamed Diem, once the promising poster child of a global stable ecosystem, stable coin ecosystem, was abandoned this week by Facebook. Diem's technology and remaining assets were sold to a small California crypto-focused bank for $200 million. Is there a common causal factor for the recent carnage in the cryptocurrency world? My hunch is that losses can be traced, at least in part, to rising inflation and the realization that interest rates must soon rise, maybe substantially. I'll come back to that thought a little bit later. Recently, the president's working group, a collection of FSOC member regulatory agencies labeled private stable coins a clear and present danger for the financial system. The working group recommended that private stable coins be treated like bank deposits and that stable coin issuers be required to comply with all banking rules and regulations. Seizing an opportunity be to become known as the US home for cryptocurrencies, in addition to being the home for, Ye for Yellowstone and the Cheneys, Wyoming took the entrepreneurial step of passing HB 74, legislation that creates crypto-friendly special purpose depository institutions. These institutions are regulated by the Wyoming Banking Commission, not federal regulators. Wyoming special purpose depository institutions are required to have capital equal to $5 million plus three years of operating expenses. They have to maintain 100% reserves against deposits and obtain private insurance against theft cybercrime, and other wrongful acts. These institutions are specifically authorized to hold digital assets for customers and must follow the custodian rules promulgated under the Investment Advisors Act of 1940. Wyoming also authorized the creation of security tokens or digital assets that represent certificated shares of stock that can be transferred to anyone using blockchain technology. Two crypto banks since been chartered under Wyoming law, Kraken and Avante. Both banks have asked for access to the traditional bank payment system by applying for master accounts with the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas, Kansas City. Decisions there are pending. Neither bank has acquired FDI insurance, deposit insurance and neither bank appears to have a pending deposit insurance application. In November, the SEC halted the registration of two digital tokens, Ducket and lock. These digital tokens were created by American Crypto Fed DAO LLC, which advertises itself as Wyoming's first decentralized autonomous corporation. Both tokens attempted to register as securities using the March 2021 SEC Token Safe Harbor Proposal 2.0, a proposal that recommended exempting crypto tokens from many of the SEC registration requirements that apply to, to traditional securities. As it turns out, the SEC proposal was only just that. And under new SEC leadership, the agency halted the digital coin registrations because the applications did not meet regulatory standards. The two tokens were DAOs, Decentralized Autonomous Organizations. DAOs are comprised of computer code that can be executed on a blockchain type distributed ledger system. DAOs are a collection of computer commands that are designed to execute a set of so-called smart contracts 
when specific conditions are satisfied using the blockchain, where the conditions can be verified using the blockchain. DAOs, DAOs do not have income statements, balance sheets, tangible equity capital, auditors, managers, board of directors, a physical address, or even a postal mail address. The business conducted by a DAOs occurs entirely using the blockchain distributed ledger, and there is no one central contact legal person responsible for its activities. A DAO is not a corporation in the traditional sense, and so it is difficult, if not impossible, for a DAO to satisfy the current SEC requirements to register as a security, or at least so it would seem to me. Are DAOs a fundamentally important innovation in the way society organizes and manages economic activity? If so, then there's a pressing need for modifications to corporate law and regulatory rules so that DAOs can legally organize and operate. If the economic case for DAOs is less compelling, there's no need to rush. Maybe our panelists will have more to say about this on this topic. Aside from discussing the legal and regulatory speed bumps encountered by DAOs, I wanna take a short detour into some social slash philosophical issues that they raise, at least when I read about them. One example is the politics of DAOs. I was surprised to learn that DAOs are political and they seem to lean left. Most of what I know about DAOs comes from reading the so-called white papers that DAO creators produce to market their DAO tokens. There is a not noticeable socialist slant in the DAO white papers I have read. A typical script will explain that DAOs create a community where every token is treated equally. The DAO eliminates corporate managers, accountants, lawyers, bankers, and bosses of any kind. A DAO has, a DAO has no corporate hierarchy, only equally empowered tokens. DAOs use dispassionate computer code to accomplish complex transactions using the DAO's preferred private stable coins and tokens. Stable, tra stable coin transactions can be created quickly and anonymously by anyone in the DAO community without bias. The only fundamental inputs required to join the DAO community and get started initiating unbiased transactions are US dollars and access to the internet. <laughs> Who knew that we needed private stable coins to avoid the bias of transacting using Federal Reserve notes? I was sort of surprised. If DAOs are a new and important method for organizing economic activity, then lawyers, accountants, bankers, and MBAs could share their fate with McDonald's French fry cooks and humans in call centers. They will soon be replaced by robots. In the case of the corporate elite, their services will be replaced, be replaced by Dale bots that are just so many lines of computer code that eliminates the need to pay their inflated salaries, healthcare, and pension benefits of the managerial class. Dale's will work for stable coins 24 seven. Why DAOs, why DAOs may catalyze, while DAOs may catalyze economic equity, what happens in the new, new DAO-centric world when a crackerjack coder finds a weak link in the DAO code or Dr. Evil perfects his quantum computer? Will DAOs morph into HAL of 2001 fame, lock Dave out of the system and empty all the DAOs stablecoin wallets? No doubt cryptologists and cybersecurity experts are working on safeguards as we speak. But enough of the DAO tangent and back to crypto tokens and SEC regulations. Many cryptocurrencies and stablecoins avoid SEC regulation by not paying interest or dividends. You can earn income in, by mining Bitcoin, but Bitcoins themselves pay no interest or dividends. Libra slash Diem was structured so that the interest earnings on its reserve assets went to the association members, not to the coin holders. In my opinion, Many existing stable coins have had a willing audience in part because short-term interest rates have been close to zero, even negative in some currencies. Coin holders were not sacrificing much, if any, return by exchanging national currencies for private stable coins. But with short-term interest rates on the rise, investors are likely to become much more concerned with earning interest on their stable coins. Once they pay interest, stable coins are securities in the eyes of the SEC and subject to the rules and regulations that apply. Much in the crypto news these days is about central bank digital currency. Facebook and Libra initiatives grabbed the attention of regulators across the globe. 
With Facebook's massive user base, many regulators worried that Libra could displace some national currencies as the preferred means of exchange. Legitimate concerns also focused on the enforcement of know your customer anti-money laundering regulations, and there were potential financial stability issues should Libra become widely adopted. Ultimately, the regulatory hurdles of launching the multi-currency Libra and even the scale black back plan for the dollar link DM coin proved to be intractable and face Facebook pulled the plug. Regulations, it seems, drained the profit from the proposition. Central banks responded to Libra and the growth and proliferation of other private stable coins by proposing that central bank digital currency be made available to the public. In the past, the public could hold central bank money only in the form of physical currency, like Federal Reserve notes or Euro notes. Central bank digital currency could only be held by banks and specialized financial institutions. Control over financial systems holding of central bank, central bank digital currency has always been a crucial aspect of monetary policy. So the idea of issuing central bank digital currency to the public is no small matter. My bet is that this topic will be covered by our panelists, so I'm gonna move on. The push for central banks to issue distributed ledger enabled digital currency raises the question, why commercial banks themselves haven't made bank deposits tradable using the internet and the blockchain? Are there legal or regulatory roadblocks for doing so? And if banks were to do so, would it obviate the need for the central bank to issue public digital currency? It turns out that at least one bank has developed a system to transfer bank deposits using the internet and blockchain technology. I know few details, but JP Morgan offers something called JPM coin that, that can be linked traditional, to traditional bank accounts. According to JP Morgan, they have built a technology that allows 24 seven instantaneous business to business transactions using JPM coin and blockchain technology. At this juncture, the future of money is, is unclear. Well, the costs and benefits of traditional bank deposits and the interbank payment system remain competitive or will it be replaced by digital currencies that are tradable over the internet and clear and settle using some sort of distributed ledger technology? Will the digital currency that trades include private stable coins, bank digital blockchain enabled deposits and central bank digital currencies or will one technology dominate? There are other aspects of FinTech I have not mentioned yet that I hope will come up in our discussions. For example, are, the, are, are there fintechs whose entire business model seems to be based on arbitra arbitraging our complex system of banking and security market regulations? I think there are some. How pervasive is this issue? I've spoken for long enough now. I know, I know we are all anxious to hear from our panelists. But before I get to that, let me remind you that you can email me or text us uh, your message, your questions, and using email, you email john, J-O-H-N dot Kearns, K-E-A-R-N-S at A-E-I dot org. Or you can text us via Twitter at hashtag ask A-E-I econ. Today we have three panelists, experts all. Their accomplishments are legion and documented at length in the, in the links in the event announcement. Speaking first will be Una McDonald. Una McDonald is an international financial regulatory expert. She is a former member of parliament and has served on many boards and government and international commissions. She is the author of numerous books and manuscript, including her newest cryptocurrencies, money, trust, and regulations. She is also a commander of the British Empire, an honor awarded her by the Queen, Queen of England for her public service to financial regulation and business. Speaking second will be Professor Charlie Calamaris. Charlie Calamaris is the Henry Kaufman Professor of Financial Institutions at Columbia Business School. He's a director of the Business School's Program for Financial Studies Initiative on Finance and Growth in Emerging Markets and a professor at Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. When it comes to banking, monetary policy and financial regulatory issues, Professor Calamaris is, is recognized as a high priest, if not a cardinal among economists. He's the author of many academic articles, editorials, and several books. He recently survived a stint in the federal government where he was a senior deputy controller for economics at the OCC. Speaking third will be Alex Pollack. Alex is a senior fellow at the Mises Institute. 
Before the firm FinTech was even coined, Alex was president and CEO of, Fed of the Federal Home Loan Bank of J Chicago, where he practiced financial innovation daily from 1991 to 2004. Subsequently, Alex spent more than 10 years as a scholar here at AEI before moving to R Street Institute and then serving in the government as principal deputy director of the Office of Financial Research in the US Treasury Department. He is the author of many articles, editorials, and several books, including a new book in process with his co-author, Howard Adler, that in part focuses on cryptocurrency. So please welcome me, please join me in welcoming Una McDonald. Uh, Una, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to be speaking here this morning. Um, Paul mentioned my book, so I'll show you a picture of this. Um, as you can see, there are faintly coins here. And one of the interesting things that I find in just talking to members of the public, who say, I don't know anything about cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin, but don't you get a coin in the end, i.e. a physical object? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and that's why I sometimes think that's why the word coin is used. <laughs> when all you're buying really, uh, when you buy Bitcoin is a, is a string of numbers on your computer screen. Um, I want to focus particularly on stable coins. And I have to say that I never thought that Libra or Diem would make it. Uh, Finma, who is going to be their um, regulator in Switzerland, spent months considering whether or not Libra stroke Diem would be a payment system. I never thought that Finma would give them that license because amongst other things, Finma was advised by about 20 central banks. So this was extremely unlikely. The other reason of course to me was nobody trusted Zuckerberg. They had already seen the extensive misuse of personal data in the past through Cambridge Analytica and they felt that his access to such a huge base of more personal data, data relating to people's finances, what would he do with that? So, and I mention the word trust here because trust is an extremely important element in the use of a fiat currency. Otherwise, why would we exchange pieces of paper with each other? or send money from one computer to another, or one mobile phone to another, if we did not believe that such payments would always be effective. The second thing that I noted, uh, three points I want to make about stable coins before we start. First of all, their claims. They claim that they will increase financial inclusion there are actually much more effective ways of doing that as the UK and the EU have the same regulations, but I will reference the UK. Banks are obliged to provide a basic bank account to those below a certain income level. That bank account provides them with a debit card. Um, it does not allow them to have overdrafts or to borrow money. It is for those people for whom um, getting into debt is an issue. And so that is why the bank limits the amount of money that they can have available. What has been the effect of that? That was made compulsory for leading banks in 2016. The most recent figures show that out of approximately 28 million households, only a quarter of a million have no access to a bank account. My view is that that's possibly as far as you can go, possibly because a number of elderly people have a no access to a computer or whatever, <laughs> and they are used to dealing in cash. And also because they have very little money. <laughs> Basic state pension is rather low. At the week by week, you're going to spend all the money that you have in your bank account now, or all the money that you might have kept 
cash that you might have kept at home because that's going to go on food, heating costs, etc. So <clears throat> fintech through via stable coins will do nothing to increase financial inclusion. There are more effective ways of doing that. Um, these are not available in the US, but maybe that's a course of action if the US seriously wants to increase the number of people with bank accounts, that that should be considered. Um, secondly, uh, Zuckerberg in particular made a great point about that this would help with remittances. Well, time has moved on and there are a wide range of payment services now which are quick and efficient extremely quick and extremely efficient and extremely low cost. Um, I've looked at the websites of a couple of these in the UK and I like the website because it tells you exactly how much it's going to cost, as low as a pound, and exactly if you're sending pounds to another country, what you will pay and what the recipient will get in their own currency. For stable coins, you have to have at least two exchanges. For new, fast, efficient payment systems, you only have one. And for stable coins, you have two, because first you've got to buy your stable coin in your fiat currency, then you send it to another country where the stable coin has to be exchanged for whatever is the currency in that country. So it is in fact, in the nature of the case, more, more expensive. And I like the transparency on some of the sites that I've looked at. And these new payment systems are developing all the time. So the basic reasons for a stable coin and the introduction of a stable coin seems to me to not those arguments just don't hold water anymore. Uh, and when policymakers consider stable coins, I think what you have to do is to look at the range of stable coins, where, they're, where their head office is, if they have one, and to your points about Deo Paul, were the ones that I was going to make, except I would add the additional question it's an ideological commitment for a decentralized stable coin. And secondly, the other question is, when, it, when you need to hold people accountable, whom do you hold accountable? That is really why we have the corporate structures that we have, that you can hold someone accountable in the end for when things go wrong. And that's a very important question. So I'm going to leave Deo aside, which I was going to discuss. I think their ideological commitment is such that they won't ever want to transfer to a corporate structure. Decentralization is the theme that you pick up in all the cryptocurrency world all the time. And very often um, stable coins or other methods are assessed as to whether or not they're decentralized or not. And if you're moving away from decentralization to centralization, this is definitely uh, almost committing a sin. <laughs> it's certainly viewed in that sort of religious commitment to an ideology light. And so I was going to talk about a number of stable coins, but I think I'd just like to talk about a couple of them. Tether is the number one stable coin. <clears throat> Though it's very interesting how much <clears throat> between January the 22nd and this morning, its trading volume has dropped from 90 billion, 90.2 billion to 55.5 billion today. Um, its market cap is of course claimed to be 78 billion. Last year, it started issuing a large number of tethers, total of 69 billion, for which it claims to have sufficient reserves. 
its reserves are now described, changed its commitment in 2019, is always 100% backed by our reserves, including traditional currency and cash equivalents, and from time to time may include other assets and receivables from loans made by Tether to third parties, which may include affiliated entities. Um, Tether has been lending its reserves, apparently, it's difficult to know exactly what's going on in Tether, to short-term loans to large Chinese companies, making loans to other crypto companies using Bitcoin as collateral, very safe collateral there. Um, it is also not based in the US. The best of my research shows that it is actually headquartered in the British Virgin Islands. But as far as anyone can make out, it is not actually registered or licensed by the regulatory authority in the British Virgin Islands, though located there. So I think it would be rather difficult. What do you want to do? Tether has been in trouble pretty well through the years. It has, of course, even been found uh, in New York considerably. Uh, settled that with a fine of about $14 million. So what do you want to do with Tether, a stable coin located outside the US? Do you really want to bring it in and consider giving it a bank charter? Well, I think Tether would have to have an awful lot of tough questions to answer if it really wanted to be uh, become a chartered bank in the US. And one would hope that in the light of negative, what I would assume would be very negative answers, that Tether would not actually get a charter. There are others that appear to be safe. Um, BUSD is linked with Paxos. And as far as I've been able to examine Paxos, it seems to be one that is willing to be compliant. It is a regulated blockchain infrastructure platform, safeguarding digital assets as a regulated trust company. It is also a crypto brokerage service and I think is regulated as that as well. <clears throat> So I don't know that I would necessarily want to be critical of that particular stable coin, except that it is linked with Binance. And I think if I was a director of Paxos, I would be asking the question, hmm, why are you getting into bed with Binance? This is a huge exchange. It has been either not licensed or regulated or chucked out of a large number of companies, of countries um, because of its behavior. And here's another difficulty. I, if I were the director asking the question, I would say, what about the reputational risk here? Are we sure that this is worth doing, even though obviously we expect to make a profit out of it because otherwise we wouldn't be doing it. The other problem with Binance is that its chief executive, having withdrawn from Hong Kong and China, says, well, they've moved all their IP ad addresses away. And he makes a kind of interesting point. He says, well, we're an internet company, so we don't need a physical location. So there is no head office for Binance located anywhere. And this creates another problem because of course you need to know where is the head office, who is being held responsible, if anything goes wrong, where do I find 
and I'm talking particularly in terms of consumer protection here, where do I find finance CEO and other officers? And can any problems that I have with Binance be settled in that way? Of course, Binance makes it clear that it is not under any jurisdiction, but well, obviously not if you don't have a physical location, but then you, you deliberately avoid any being under any jurisdiction, which makes me wonder a little about the contract, any contractual terms that Paxos may have agreed with Binance because under what jurisdiction's law? Very often, even if you're not located there, you can uh, ensure that your contract is under English law. So that's another problem with another stable coin. And I think I'm going to limit myself to two examples, but I think that's enough for me to make the general point. Um, Chairman Powell said the other day that stable coins could exist alongside a central bank digital currency if America goes that way. And I think, well, why? What would you need them for? A stable coin linked to, directly to, with a one-to-one -one link, uh, seems to me to be but a parasite. And that's why I really cannot understand why people buy stable coins. Uh, well, I can think of two reasons. First of all, there's a very strong motive that we have to understand or try to understand in all of this, and that's the fear of missing out, of not being up to date, of not being fashionable. And that is an extremely powerful motive underlying the purchase of all kinds of tokens well beyond stable coins, including um, the latest one, the, I'm going into the non-fungibles now, is you could buy Tina Turner's Versace dress, which she wore at a particular concert. I'm not, a, I know nothing about Tina Turner, but apparently she wore this Versace dress. And you could spend $100,000 buying a dress which you would never be able to wear, but you could look at a picture of it. I don't understand this, but that's what people are doing. And stable coins are part of that. The other reason for purchasing a stable coin is, of course, anonymity in transfers of payments from one person to another. And that's obviously an important reason. And we've all read the chain analysis uh, latest report on the extent to which stable coins can be and DeFi can be used for money laundering. So what should we do with stable coins? Well, my view is that the first thing to do with stable coins, and this would be for their websites, I would like total transparency. So the website for any stable coin should include full details of the company, location, contact details, names and descriptions of senior managers, nor do I contact if anything goes wrong. How do I redeem my stable coins? That should be clearly set out for all customers, including the point that there should be no gains or losses in the process of redemption clear legal guarantees that stable coin can be redeemed at any time with the US dollar, if that's the one I bought, and that will require both sufficient reserves and a custodian to hold those reserves. All the fees involved in acquiring the stable coin, domestic and international transfers, and the daily exchange rate should be clearly displayed. Like some of the repayment, new payment systems, that's all so clearly expressed that you can, anyone can understand it. Now, some stable coins are all are providing attestation provided by an accountancy firm that the company holds sufficient reserves to maintain the one-to-one -one exchange rate. 
But I think that more than that is required, not just an attestation. I don't know what that's based on. Did the accountancy firm get that right? So therefore, I would want the full account details on the website, or at least a link to those on the website. And all of this should be expressed in clear, easily understandable language. We have the benefit of something in the UK, which uh, the regulatory authorities used both for themselves and also for any regulated form. We had the plain English campaign and you submit what you wish to say to this campaign through checks that it really is clearly understandable by anybody reading it. Um, so all those is contained in guidelines for documents issued to consumers. Um, I, I am mentioning some of the UK practices because I've seen them work pretty well. <laughs> over the years, and I think that those are worth following. Now, it's not clear that those changes could be imposed on stablecoin providers without changes to the law, without changes to legislation. But um, I think here, yeah, the use of the Consumer Financial Protective Protection Bureau could at least propose these as a series of questions, which those looking at buying a stable coin should expect to find answers to those questions on their website. And that at least would be a beginning, it would be a way of setting standards. And I think that that would be the best way to do it. The FCA has the power to ensure that financial promotions and adverts conform to their rules and treat customers fairly. Um, that is going to be extended to cover uh, celebrity promotions, such as Kim Kardashian, promoted a crypto token called Ethereum Max. You note that it's always near something that's already familiar, but not quite the same. To her 250 million Instagram followers, that turned out to be a pump and dump scheme. And I see that groups of American investors are putting together class actions to sue Kardashian over her promotion of that. So I think also looking at financial promotions and advertisements should be a part of the process. I guess what I think is that under the strong sunlight of requirements, push towards such information appearing on your website, that maybe the stable coins, at least some of them, would begin to wither and die. The ones that remain may conform to such standards, but one has to remember the way in which those operate on the exchanges. So I think for your point about looking at the exchanges as well would come in here in order to regulate them, because what can happen is the exchange holds the public and private keys to um, stable coins purchased through a particular exchange. The other point is that in itself will not work what you have to look at then is the person who enters the exchange through their own computer, the transaction can be observed on the public blockchain, but not the recipient, so that you can actually transfer money through the exchanges, but it depends on your access to the exchange 
on the way in which you use that, and that would have to be examined. It is also important to prevent exchanges from holding both the public and private keys of those who have purchased Bitcoin, stable coins or whatever through that exchange, because if the exchange collapses, then everybody loses their money. And in my book, what I have done is to set out all the well-known scams that have taken place and set those out in detail so that people begin to understand the risks. And also you begin to see how <clears throat> Bitcoin, no, took too long to develop. ICOs, the initial coin offerings, began to be caught as they should have been by IPOs. Stable coins emerged, avoid volatility because you're linking it to a fiat currency. So there's been a development of fintech through those means. I want to say just quickly in closing, <clears throat> that if you removed, let's say stable coins from the equation, this in no way prevents the continuing innovations which we've already seen in payment systems with FinTech. And there's another development that needs a great deal more thought, but I would like to see FinTech being used to make banks dealing with, say, money laundering requirements much quicker, more quickly and much easier, much more easily by use of red flags. I had to deal with one recently with a very well-known uh, American bank. <clears throat> I won't try and describe the whole setup, but money due from a client was sent to a different bank account number and a different bank account. And then that money was diverted because the name on the wire transfer did not tally with the name on the bank account. The numbers were the same. So over $100,000 were transferred to that bank account. The numbers did not tally. Now, FinTech could easily- no, 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 you, have to, you have to please finish up because you're, you're uh, over time. My apologies. Okay. I was just going to give that as an example of the way in which fintech innovations could be more usefully used. Okay, apologies for taking Thank you. Two. Charlie. Thanks very much. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here with three of my best friends in the profession and people I really enjoy talking to and learning from. And what's especially delightful and rare is that I have an opportunity to find points of disagreement with uh, at least one of my very good friends because I never managed to do that because I tend to agree with only about just about everything. Um, but in this case, we will have uh, some disagreement. Uh, I'm having a little trouble with my computer, so just bear with me for one second. Don't know why. All right, um, I have to bring that back up. I apologize, we had all this sorted out before, but I somehow managed to uh, mess it up anyway.
I am not finding my slide deck. I'm sorry. I'm just not finding it in the uh, screen sharing options, which is very inconvenient. Do you want to? Do you want to let Alex go and while you? Actually, I think that it would be very logical though for me to go because I I, I think I can follow up on, on many of the things that Odin okay. said. So if you don't mind, just bear with me a second. I think um, the. There's no good reason why this isn't working. So I feel like at any moment, I will see that it will. So I apologize to everyone for the delay. Ah, see, there it is. My prediction came true. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I want to make two introductory comments about um, blo uh, blockchain and, and stablecoin in particular. Uh, the first one is that I think Onig's right that we, if we're looking for a reason for stablecoin to exist, we have to sort of explore um, the the services that that it can provide and the benefits it can provide. But I think we have to do that from the standpoint of the existing banking system and how it compares. And to me, the main argument in favor of uh, stablecoin, and I'm a confident exponent of uh, stablecoin being important going forward is that the existing banking system is doing so badly. As, that is, we are not sitting in a world of efficiency nirvana. Instead, we're sitting in a world of a very dysfunctional banking system. And it's largely dysfunctional because of politics of regulation and regulatory costs that are crippling the ability of the banking system, despite all the technological progress of really adapting to those technologies and taking full advantage of FinTech innovations. And so the promise of FinTech, including stablecoin, but not only stablecoin, is largely its ability to restart um, from a different kind of framework, one that's not crippled by the politics of bank regulation. And so I think, that's the, the starting point for any serious discussion of fintech is that we are interested in fintech as in the fintech future, largely because our banking system and our regulatory structure has been politicized to a point of being crippled. Our, our banking system is performing very badly uh, in terms of not just its profitability, but also its efficiency. It also has done a very poor job of, of financial inclusion compared to what it could achieve. So I think we really have to start with, well, is there something wrong with the status quo? And the answer is, oh boy, is there? And, there, and, and its disease has to do mainly with the regulatory process and its politicization. And that's where FinTech and particularly stablecoin is so refreshing and, and interesting. The second point I wanna start with is, <clears throat> I've always argued that the desirable version of stablecoin will look very different from the current version and from the examples that Onik Un talked about. And I believe the danger of regulation, which is all too convenient to the uh, people who are uh, the uh, proponents of the status quo because they are the beneficiaries of the status quo. The real danger from the regulation that we're seeing from the presence working group uh, sort of the beginning of it or from Fed statements is that that might call, cut off the natural evolution and I would say the predictable and beneficial evolution of the design of stable coins in a better direction. Um, I note that you know Onyx proposals aren't particularly uh, damaging or horrible so I don't really disagree with the idea of uh, reacting a little bit to some of the problems of the existing versions but I'm much more worried about uh, the, the view that stable coins should be uh, heavily regulated or even prohibited and viewed as inherently very risky things. I think that's wrong. So um, I'm going to not be able to give you a full screen, but I, I guess, can you see the, uh, the current slides pretty well? Yes, good. <coughs> So I want to start then where I said I would begin, which is 
with an analysis of why it is that the banking system is losing market share to fintech in the first place. And um, I'm going to go over some graphs on loan originations and also a little bit of, about payment processors. But I just want to point out, stablecoin is just an example of the next phase of the development of fintech, which is seeing a major decline, is producing a major decline in the market shares of existing traditional banks. Um, and that when we think about stablecoin, it's because it's one of the most interesting versions of moving the payment system to a more efficient place than the existing backward and efficient banks. And the reason that stablecoin as opposed to let's say Bitcoin could be especially useful is that people won't ever wanna keep their real liquid balance accounts in something as crazy as Bitcoin, which is very unstable. If, if the typical American wants to put a thousand or $2,000 into a liquid asset, to be able to use to transact and keep it in an account somewhere, they're going to want the value of that to be stable. Uh, they don't want the value of it to be bouncing around as Paul noted from the beginning uh, about Bitcoin. So stable coins, if they can be credibly stable and if they can produce efficient transacting technology, offer a, a, an alternative place for you to keep your money where it's much more efficient uh, and not part of that bad politicized regulatory equilibrium. And I think that's why a lot of people are excited about it. So we'll talk more about, I wanna talk more about the details. Let me just point out in case you're wondering why I say the market share of banks has been falling, you can see on personal loans that marketplace lenders market share has just skyrocketed. We weren't talking about these things much 10 years ago, but it's precisely in the last nine years that the real changes have occurred. Um, and I won't belabor that point. I wanna point out that there's something more important underlying that, and that is what I call unbundling. Uh, unbundling, of course, is a reversal of the process that we've seen in the 1980s and 1990s, where we had universal banking evolving, banks doing combinations of things much more in the US, that is the bundling of different services, the bundling of the payments and lending side, but then we even combine it with underwriting, asset management, insurance. And that bundling, we thought, I thought, made sense in the 1980s and 1990s. But now we're seeing a reversal of that. What's the efficiency advantage of unbundling? That is, notice that fintech providers are typically specializing either in a lending function or in a payments function, not the combination of the two. And I believe that it's clear that that is the result of changes in technology that make unbundling the efficient way to organize our banking system. So all of these big behemoth intermediaries are just buggy whips. They are a holdover technology that doesn't want to disappear because of their entrenched special interests. When in fact, I'll argue that the future of banking is an unbundled platform-based, fintech-based kind of system in which intermediaries no longer do the combination of payments and lending, but more efficiently will do one or the other. And I have background paper on this for people who are interested, but I'll just say it really comes down to the fact that the pros of bundling are loans and deposits have, have really disappeared as a result of technology. So there's no longer the difficulty of finding external funding sources nor are there particularly informational synergies as there have traditionally been uh, for intermediaries uh, between processing loans and payments. And that's because technological change has created new kinds of information technologies and new kinds of ease of access of funding. And so it's always inefficient to do combinations of things unless there's a good reason for combining them we used to have good reasons that were largely based on information and physical costs of, of accessing funding that no longer exists. And therefore, what we're seeing is the new technologies are the new kinds of intermediaries are themselves showing us this unbundled world. Uh, the implication is traditional banks market shares will continue to fall unless politicians do their best to preserve their favored special interests, that is these large behemoth banks, uh, and, and try to preserve them despite their declining profitability and their extreme inefficiency. 
So shadow banking will continue to rise. Of course, that means less regulatory control over the financial system. Um, I think that in my own view, and when I was at the OCC, I championed this view that a bank chartering policy that would try to encourage the chartering of fintechs, including stable coin issuers, would be beneficial. Um, it would uh, allow them to operate in new, innovative, and cost savings ways. Uh, and it would solve a lot of the problems that Onik talked about, precisely because, as she said, they'd have to answer a lot of questions. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we would like them to answer some questions. We just don't want them to have to be saddled with all of the political, costly political baggage that our current regulatory system imposes on all of our banks. So let's not use a, a phony, and I'm not saying anything Onik said was phony, a phony set of concerns that our politicians have about instability, risk, uncertainty, whatever words they want to use to try to just preserve the status quo that they like because of their own powerful vested interests. Um, so now let me talk a little bit more about uh, FinTech. Um, so here's a list of, uh, we could talk as economists for a long time about the gains that are coming from FinTech. It's basically having to do with physical costs of transacting that are lower. Um, it's having to do with informational improvement, lower information costs that it's allowing the use of new information. And as I said, this is more efficient, particularly in an unbundled environment. And the future advantages have to do with things we, we banks haven't even been able to achieve, like more uh, financial inclusion because of these innovative new approaches to information, which can bring more people into the banking system. And also security advantages related to blockchain. There's a lot of concern right now about centralized payment systems being hacked, including by researchers at the Fed. And so blockchain networks could be extremely beneficial from that standpoint. So we, there's a lot of gains to be had. And now I just want to focus the remainder of my time on, on uh, stable coins in particular. So um, I don't think that stable coins need to have the features that we're currently seeing. In particular, I don't think the efficient and most stable and desirable version of stable coins will have redemption on demand. Um, that is something that people are presuming. And in fact, Onan sort of presumed it in her discussion, I would say. I think it, it's unnecessary. You don't need redemption on demand. That's just extrapolating from our experience in creating demandable deposits in our banks. But I don't think stable coins should be anything like deposits and that they certainly, in my view, shouldn't be demandable deposits. So I do think that it would be very useful for them to have very large, but not 100% necessarily, reserve holding balances. Um, I also agree that it would work much better if those reserve holdings were transparently and credibly held somewhere. And also if the algorithms that they were issuing were transparent and credible, and that they were also committed to avoiding criminal activities. These are all things that chartering of course would achieve. Um, and I think, as I said, we don't need redemption uh, to create stability. Um, we can create algorithmic commitments to purchasing and selling um, coins in the secondary market in response to deviations of their price away from par. And it is not at all difficult to show very clearly with a little bit of math that that will work to create stabilities. So my point is we can make stable coins a clearly non-debt claim that will avoid possibilities of runs or redemption risks. And it can also, most importantly, if you're a stable coin designer, hear me on this one, it will avoid your being deemed a deposit as I predicted in advance the president's working group and various regulators are trying to do. If you aren't a, a, a debt, then you can't be a deposit. So my own view is the right way to design these is to think more of them as perpetual preferred stock and to use secondary market trading to ensure their stability. I don't wanna belabor my points too much about how to do that, um, but I, I, I wanna just point out that it is not at all difficult to create stability without redemption and without debt commitment. And something like a 
perpetual preferred stock instrument. Imagine that's what a stable coin is, where there's no demand commitment to convert, but where you're keeping very large, maybe up initially 100% balances of cash assets uh, somewhere where they can be credibly observed and that that's standing by and standing behind and making credible your ability to do the secondary market transactions I have in mind. I think ideally if it were chartered, um, that would really solve a lot of the informational problems about the commitment of these algorithms because we have examiners looking at them, um, the commitment to maintain credible accounting because we have examiners looking at it and the commitment to avoid illegal transactions. So I, I see huge technical advantages to this, gross time real settlement, uh, gross real time settlement, I meant to say, um, using blockchain. Also the payment system will develop new abilities, new capacity, for example, to transmit messages simultaneously with payments. And the, the blockchain means that this old creaky payment system that we're still using in the US could, could disappear with great benefit to consumers um, to not just have a better payment system, a much faster one, a much lower cost one, and one that also could do some additional things. Now this vision that I have of what stable blockchain would be, of course, is absolutely hated by all of the potential incumbent losers. And who are they? Well, of course, the big banks, um, and you have to have a little sympathy for the big banks because the reason their businesses stink so badly is not only their fault. It's the fault of the government that protects them. And the government largely protects them because it imposes so many costs on them that without protection, they couldn't survive the competition. So their big brother in the government gives them an ability to continue to survive despite their pathetic performance and, to know, and also with the promise of trying to prevent others from competing with them. Um, the Fed, of course, is a big part of this constituency. It stands to lose hugely power uh, from operating that centralized payment system. There's another issue, which is that the Fed knows that its current toolkit has already been undermined by financial regulation and by unbundling and will be so further. And that the Fed is forced to focus instead on what I would call fiscal interventions like paying above market interest on interest on reserves, making purchases of particular securities like mortgage-backed securities, targeting the interest rate through its repo transactions that money market mutual funds can get so that they can have a viable business model. This is all subsidization of particular activities and sectors. And that is actually what monetary policy has become. In other words, monetary policy, the policy of the Fed is really just fiscal policy. The Fed knows how vulnerable it is politically, how much its own governance is ill-suited to being a fiscal policymaker. Nobody elected them for starters. And so the Fed is very concerned about things that could shake up the financial system and of course lose uh, its power through control of the payment system. And of course, politicians, especially, but not only the Democrats who run the whole sort of housing CRA uh, industrial complex, recognize the extreme value of their existing method of reg using regulation as an alternative to budgeted expenditure to accomplish their objectives. It's much easier to get regulators to do things than it is to actually pass legislation to accomplish transfers. So I'll end with this, my predictions and my advice. I already predicted, uh, so I wrote uh, the paper that says what I've been saying today, predicting what the president's working group would do, predicting what the Fed would do, predicting what everyone all these people with the incumbent special interests at stake, predicting that they would say that stable coins are inherently risky and all the rest of it. They're not, they're not at all inherently risky. Their design will improve. They will be able to do more faster and better uh, like all of the unbundled financial services of the future if politics allows them to exist. Um, bank regulators will try to force stable coins to look like deposits. And that's why designers of stable coins need to follow my advice to not make them redeemable, to not make them debt instruments. Instead, to make them things that can survive without any of that baggage. So stablecoin entrepreneurs need to do that. Um, on my advice to other smaller countries uh, that I've been talking to is avoid believing 
uh, the things that are coming out of the politicized central bank and regulatory process in the United States. Don't be scared by what you're hearing. And in fact, see a, a global opportunity for small countries to be the places where some of these things are headquartered. Um, and I want to end with a, a political point. If, you, if we want to see a future of unbundled, more efficient and less politicized finance coming into existence, we have to build a coalition to oppose what I call the three-legged stool of the current political coalition of banking, which is all about very consolidated big financial intermediaries, about government protection, and about a focus on real estate funding, Community Reinvestment Act, and all of that other politicized stuff. So we need to find a coalition that wants to support a future that's not the politicized three-legged stool that we're currently dealing with. Um, so sign me up if anybody wants to start that process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie. Um, Alex? Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for having me on this extremely interesting panel. Thanks for mentioning my new book, which will be out uh, in August or so this year. It's called Surprised Again, and uh, financial markets always keep surprising us, however much we think about them. I, in my comments today, I want to uh, uh, think about cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, stable currencies, and also central bank digital currencies as a grand dialectic uh, between money as a state monopoly and various private forms of money, or at least the possibility of private forms of money. Now, Charlie, in talking about politics a minute ago, made me think of his uh, brilliant book, Fragile by Design, in which he pointed out that every banking system is a deal between politicians and bankers. Uh, I summarize this by saying there's no such thing as banking, there's only political banking. And I'm quite sure that the way that cryptocurrencies will end up is there'll be no such thing as cryptocurrencies. There'll only be political cryptocurrencies, and that will be against the original idea uh, which gave birth to them. Uh, now, a, a key uh, experience of um, financial history, I imagine, uh, and, and the financial present is that central banks lead to inflation and depreciation of the official currency. And they especially do so as they monetize government debts and therefore make uh, fiscal expansion possible. Uh, and in thinking about this, I want to go back to a classic text, which seems to me is at the uh, core of cryptocurrency thinking. And that is an essay by Friedrich Hayek, 1976, called Choice in Currency a way to stop inflation. Uh, and in this essay, which I'm going to quote here for a little bit, Hayek writes, practically all governments of history have used their exclusive power to issue money in order to defraud and plunder the people. There's less ground forever for hoping that as long as the people have no choice but to use the money of their government, governments will become more trustworthy. There's no hope they'll become more trustworthy. What is so dangerous not to be done away with is not government's right to issue money, Hayek writes, but the exclusive right to do so and the right to force people to use it. The monopoly of government is the problem. And all history contradicts the belief that governments have given us safer money than we would have had without their exclusive right. So why should we not let people choose freely what money they want to use? I have no objection to governments issuing money, but I believe their claim to monopoly or their power to limit the kinds of money in which contracts may be concluded within their territory is wholly harmful, wrote Hayek. And there could be no more effective check against the abuse of money by the government than if people were free to prefer the money in which they had confidence. If governments and other issuers of money have to compete in inducing people to hold their money, uh, then it will be better for their long-term stability. Now, uh, 
I, it concludes, I hope it will not be too long before the complete freedom to deal in any money one likes will be regarded as the essential mark of a free country. Now this all seems theoretically to write to me, but, but can it work in fact? And, uh, I think the ideas though, those concepts are at the base of the original cryptocurrency movement. Indeed, as Una, Una, I have a copy of your book here too. As Una writes, the claim, uh, quoting Una, the claim has often been made over the last decade or so that it's the lack of trust in central banks, fiat currencies, financial intermediaries such as banks, which has led to the introduction of cryptocurrencies. That, of course, she says, was the reason for Nakamoto's introduction of Bitcoin. The lack of trust in central banks and national currencies set the stage for the arrival of private substitutes. However, as has been said by others, uh, Bitcoin is the problem uh, that it doesn't have the stability characteristics of a currency. And in fact, uh, it has uh, instead uh, proven to be, as the, uh, as the Bank for International Settlements have written, uh, only a speculative asset rather than money. So uh, nonetheless, it's a certainly a highly interesting speculative asset. The, uh, the celebrated investor Stanley Druckenmiller, uh, emphasizing in Hayek's point in a little more colorful language, said the problem, the problem that resulted in cryptocurrencies, the problem was Jay Powell and the world's central bankers going nuts and making fiat money even more questionable than it already was when I used to own gold, uh, said Druckenmiller. Well, um, so here we have this, this fundamental uh, conflict between the idea of a government monopoly and money and is there a possibility of private monies? And if, if so, uh, what is the uh, what is the answer? Uh, and Bitcoin seems not to be the answer as a money, however interesting it may be uh, as a speculation, uh, behaving like speculations, that's to say going down 50% as well as up 100%. Uh, Una concludes, however, the creation and distribution of cryptocurrencies has not turned out to be trustworthy or part of a, a spontaneous new order in an attempt to inspire trust. Therefore, some have turned to the application of existing frameworks. Now this of course uh, means, the, uh, means the stable coin. So the stable coin, if it's let's say a dollar tied uh, stable coin is tied uh, to the existing national currency, the government's private fiat currency. And it's very hard to say that uh, if you're tied to the dollar, that you're somehow creating an alternative to the dollar. You're not. You're creating a new payment system. I think that's Charlie's argument. You might have a, a payment, a payment product that's different. But the fundamental money of the of a dollar tied stablecoin is still the dollar, uh, controlled uh, by uh, the central bank. So if you if your attempt to gain currency as money is by linking yourself to the dollar or any other national currency, you've certainly not escaped the central bank uh, and you have not escaped the state monopoly of money. Uh, you may have escaped the chartered banks, Charlie, depending on what kind of charter you get yourself in the end. Uh, if you have stable coins, if the central bank continues its history of depreciating the dollar in terms of its purchasing power, which is certainly what we have going on now, as we all know, with the high inflation, then the purchasing power of your stable coin uh, goes down as well, uh, automatically. So again, this uh, stable coin looks like a variation in the payment system, uh, but not a new currency. Uh, we'd have to say that compared to that, Bitcoin is certainly a much more radical idea uh, because Bitcoin is tried to be truly a private fiat currency, not tied to the dollar, not tied to any national currency, uh, but of course also tied to no asset whatsoever. 
and no cash flow. Uh, can you get a private currency that's tied to no asset and no cash flow? You can certainly get a fascinating speculative vehicle, uh, but I doubt that you can get a currency. You know, historically, of course, government currencies were tied to assets, namely gold and silver coins. National bank notes under the national banking system set up in 1863 and four were secured by bonds of the United States. And even the famous tulip craze in the Netherlands, well, tulip bulbs were at least actually existing physical things. And even if you lost money on the price, you could still grow yourself a tulip. Uh, but Bitcoin uh, is only, uh, as Una said, an electronic entry on a distributed set of books tied to no asset and no cash flow uh, at all. And I completely agree with Una, uh, and she didn't quite say it this way, but I will, that one of the most fantastic marketing successes of current times is convincing people to call them a coin. And even more convincing all the newspapers and magazines and, uh, and uh, internet postings to put pictures of gold coins at the top of practically uh, every article you read about bitcoins has a picture of gold coins with a B on them. And of course, uh, they have nothing to do with gold coins. Even Real Clear Markets yesterday, yesterday ran two articles on cryptocurrencies and both of them had pictures of gold coins with B on them. So nothing could be less like a gold coin than an electronic entry on some distributed computerized books. So as I say, I think that was an active uh, a marketing genius. Uh, so in the end, uh, uh, in the Bitcoin class, can a private accounting entry tied to no asset and no cash flow, work as a currency, uh, I, I, I doubt it. Now, of course, governments these days, although they used to tie their currency to physical things, as I said, like gold and silver coins, uh, at least since 1971, have not. Since 1971, we have all lived in the Nixonian world of pure fiat currencies, the Nixonian world monetary revolution uh, in the workings of the monetary system. Um, but there the government still has a taxing power, which is a future cash flow. And even more, it has the general power of the state uh, behind the currency and the state's uh, ability to compel through force. Um, now, stable coins do tie to an asset in some way, not always a real clear way, as Una rightly said. Um, they, they are tied to the dollar, but they hold assets, as they say, a, a reserve. Well, what are these uh, reserves? Uh, what are the assets that go along uh, with the liabilities, and Charlie, even if we didn't think they were liabilities of the stable coin issuer, but a kind of equity, uh, still we'd be interested in the assets that were related, that you owned through this equity. Um, and what are they? How do you know? And what's the relationship between the assets and the liabilities? And in this way, as Wells Fargo uh, economists have written, uh, in essence, stable coin issuers resemble 19th century commercial banks. Uh, this, this seems to me right, even though it's disputed by some people. Um, you put out non-interest bearing liabilities in the form of your stable coin. You promise to redeem them at par under the current system. And you invest the proceeds in interest earning assets. And as Paul said, you keep the difference. Uh, as your profit. Well, that's a 19th century note issuing bank. And I think it's pretty close analogy to a stable coin company. And of course, the temptation in all such uh, arrangements is that you run up the risk 
of the assets more and more to make more profit uh, until the assets relative to the liabilities are no longer to honor, uh, are no longer able to honor your redemption at par. So uh, it seems to me this is a rather old financial idea. I'll go further, uh, Charlie, if you would want to have the only, uh, the stable coins not be debt, but be equity uh, and not pay, well, now they're not interest bearing. You, you said preferred stock. I guess they'd have to pay a dividend if they were a preferred stock. Uh, then they look just like a 1920s original mutual savings and loan, which did not, which was in most cases, they were prohibited from holding deposits or from having deposits. Uh, they're on the liability side, they were all equity. That's why they called them shares and they pay dividends. So this is a way of, uh, of saying, when we come to FinTech, I think there's lots of innovation in the tech part. And that's really the payments part. But in the fundamental financial ideas, it's really hard to have a new fundamental financial idea, like a new form of money. Um, that's much harder than having a new form of a payments product. Uh, well, coming back to uh, stable coins, what kinds of assets are appropriate? What are the real rights of the holders of the stable coin? What other liabilities does the stable coin issuer have besides the stable coins? Uh, What, uh, what other claims, in other words, might there be on the so-called reserves? And way, the way to handle this is exactly what Uda said. We need disclosure, but the easiest way is true and full financial statements. An audited balance sheet and an audited profit and loss statement uh, and all the rest of the, the formal financial statements. And then you'd have a much better idea uh, of what was going on as any, of any holder uh, of this claim. And of course, also you have to be clear about if there is redemption, uh, what actually are the rights and the conditions of redemption. Now I wanna switch from the providers of the uh, Bitcoins and the stable coins and other cryptocurrencies to thinking about governments. Well, what do governments want? Well, we know governments want to command resources. And one of the best ways to command resources is to have a money printing central bank, which gives you command of resources. So in the, it seems free in the short term. It has longer term disadvantages, but uh, it's a great way to command resources. Why do you want to command resources? Well, you want to give money to the people who vote for you. Uh, you want to fight wars. You want to control asset allocation, and you want to do all the other projects, some, some good and some bad that governments like to undertake. The introduction of private currency on the theory of Hayek with which I began, or the, or the original theory of Bitcoin, definitely looks challenging to the state and to the state's ability through its central bank uh, to control money, which is so useful to the state. And therefore, uh, what we will see is if, to the extent that that becomes challenging and threatening to the state, it will be controlled in some way. It could be uh, taxed out of existence the way state bank notes were taxed out of existence in the US in the 19th century. It could simply be made illegal as China has done with cryptocurrencies. Or it could be to require, for example, stable coins to be regulated as a bank, chartered, regulated, controlled, uh, reported on, and, and then you can uh, and then you uh, can control it. And as Paul pointed out, uh, one of the results of this uh, of this counterattack by the government on the on the possibility of private money was Facebook uh, giving up on its uh, very ambitious uh, private money project, which is now, uh, which is now dead, it seems. So uh, another part of the counterattack 
of the state. So if you start off with Hayek, a monopoly of money, the challenge from Bitcoin, a private fiat currency or stable, stable coins, a, a sort of a revival of 19th century uh, note issuing banks, uh, but a, 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 an equally powerful counterattack is the idea of central bank digital currency. So in this grand dialectic, you start off with let's have some private money and the idea of the digital money instead gets taken over uh, by the central bank as central bank digital currency. Uh, has a, has a nice Hegelian flavor to it, I think, this dialectic. Uh, now, the, the question of whether central banks should issue their own digital currencies is being discussed all over the world, and, and uh, dozens of central banks, including the Federal Reserve, are working on it. And of course, as has often been said, it isn't that we don't have digital dollars already. It's every bank account is a digital dollar. It's a digital dollar, which is a direct liability of the central bank itself tied to the power of the state, both to tax and compel uh, and put in uh, the hands of the public in general. Uh, about, these, um, about these central bank digital currencies or the, the possibility of having your account with the central bank, either directly or indirectly through an intermediary, there are a lot of uh, interesting questions. And Paul, you can have a, Maybe we can have another conference just on central bank digital currencies. Uh, but among the questions are, um, should such accounts pay interest? Of course, the central bank would prefer to be able to pay interest. This greatly increases its power. If it could pay interest, how high could the interest be? If the interest could be high enough, the central bank will become the monopoly deposit taker uh, in the country. Um, even more important, when you take in the deposits, there have to be assets correspondingly. So as the deposits flow to the central bank, what will the assets of the central bank be? Uh, what kinds of investments will it make? Will it only finance the government? Will it get into corporate debt? Maybe it could buy equities like the Swiss National Bank already does. Maybe it could do. Uh, put deposits back into the commercial banks that got sucked out of the banks by the central bank uh, digital currency, and then it could control the banks uh, even better. And as many people have pointed out, there's a huge privacy concern should the central bank be able thereby to track all of your, all of your financial transactions. So you have looming up through central bank digital currencies, the possibility of an extremely powerful, extremely centralized uh, uh, potential deposit monopoly and very powerful asset allocator and asset controller, also an information uh, source for the government about everything that uh, you and everybody uh, else are doing. Now, of course, the uh, Central banks say, well, we're not interested in using everybody's information to snoop on them and control their behavior. We're not going to try to have make our uh, central bank digital currency into a Chinese style social credit uh, system. But on this, uh, Una was nice enough to send me a couple of weeks ago the transcript of a wonderful hearing in the House of Lords in England. And then the course of this hearing, uh, the uh, governor of the Bank of England was asked if, if this central bank digital currency could be about monetary policy. He said, no, it's not about monetary policy. The chairman of the committee, Lord Forsyth of Drumley, said, but it could be. The governor said, that's not my, not my view of the world. And the governor said, I'm sure it's not yours, but governors come and go. The question is whether it could be used for this purpose. Now, I apply this same logic to the personal information and the danger of it. I'm sure it's true that the current central bankers don't intend or mean to have this uh, equivalent to the social credit network. But how about some future? How about some future well, uh, 
central bankers appointed by some future radical government. Uh, the possibility is certainly there on the part on the information side and the BIS uh, itself, the Bank for International Settlements, has talked about how there, there is a scenario in which with a central bank digital currency, quote, the central bank becomes the main intermediary between the CBDC holders, that is to say, everybody's deposit and the real economy, in other words, an immensely powerful state bank. Uh, now, is that what we want? The, the, uh, a state bank is inevitably politicized. And uh, Charlie, if we want to see the real politics of banking, wait until it's run by a centralized monopoly state deposit taker. Uh, and lender who also controls the information. Uh, I don't say it would necessarily happen, but it certainly could happen. And um, there we have a, a very interesting movement of dialectic from the government monopoly of currency uh, in the Nixonian fiat currency, the inflation, the revolt by Bitcoin, the idea that you could have private currencies and private cryptocurrencies to the taking over of the digital idea by the central banks uh, themselves. And this uh, presents as a whole story, a very vivid irony indeed. Thanks. Thank you, Alex. Um, and thank you all. I want to just start by revisiting a job I had uh, probably 20 years ago. When I was in the IMF, one of the assignments I was given uh, was to draft a paper uh, with um, someone who was my boss, the former controller or the acting controller of the currency. Um, and the paper was uh, how state banks are really bad for economies. They're just, they're just horrible. All the, all the reasons why uh, you you don't want to have a state bank and and it's out there somewhere and uh, I you know I, I dutifully applied and it was published in some IMF sponsored volume somewhere so and you were so time. right Paul you were so right <laughs> yeah. yeah well back then that was the uh, that was the religion I guess it's changed now that uh, <laughs> Tobias Adrian is uh, in charge of the banking part of the IMF he's all he's all in for digital currency, I guess. Um, the, there's a couple points I wanna come up. First, Charlie, um, you make this interesting point that you think the, uh, the future is unbundling and, and, and that's really uh, important. And that's what's going to, uh, that's what's gonna save us all from the sclerosis of the banking system. But is, so is, is unbundling financial services are there true economic efficiencies there, or is it just that if you don't take deposits, you don't have to abide by certain regulations, if you raise your money another way, if you don't make loans, then you're, you're not subject to certain kinds of regulations. Is it, just, is it just that it's more efficient because if you do a single activity, there's more scope to avoid uh, you know, the thousands and thousands of pages and millions and millions of dollars you have to pay banking and securities lawyers is is or is there are is are there real efficiencies for uh separating uh all the different activities are, are you asking me to respond now well it, it great i you're the one that made me think of that question okay so so i i my answer is clearly there are big economic efficiency gains from unbundling because they, we always have efficiency gains for unbundling unless there's a very strong reason to bundle. And you know, if you look at the current intermediaries, like look at Citibank. As an organization, um, Citigroup's uh, market to book ratio has been below one since the financial crisis. Citigroup is a value destroying entity economically. And that's even after taking into account all the subsidy protection it's getting from the US government in its stock value. Citibank is just a value destroyer. Yes, regulation's a big part of that cost, but I think another part of it is just the tolerance for fools 
that comes from government protection of these behemoth organizations. They're just badly managed. Uh, the more complexity of their organizations, the more badly managed. And then contrast that with these new startups, fintech organizations, very well-focused businesses, cutting edge technology, no government protection, where people have every incentive to adopt new technologies, meet customers' needs, and perform well. So it's pretty clear to me that the regulation is largely the cause of not only its own costs, but of the other inefficiencies that are related to the poor performance of these bundled organizations that are just too complex to manage effectively, but their complexity is not coming from the economics of the desirability of complexity, but from the politics of being bigger, being more uh, with their hands in everything and therefore getting even more protection. So yes, I think it's pretty clear that banking organizations are unprofitable. <laughs> They're, you know, our largest banks are just not very good at what they do. We had a panel that you organized for us, Paul, a few months ago, where we all explored that um, with uh, some other members, Bert Ely and uh, Dick Silla. And you know, I, I think it's just absolutely clear how interesting it was from that panel that we all agreed that the banking system is in decline. And of course, Alex has produced a very nice uh, discussion of you know, what's happened over the last 50 years in banking. So yeah, I, I, I think it's pretty obvious that if it weren't for this three-legged stool of extreme consolidation, government protection and politicized activities enforced by real estate mandates, Community Reinvestment Act, all the rest of it, that you, you just wouldn't have this mess, which is the current American banking system as the status quo. Does anybody else care to weigh in on that? No? Okay. Um, I guess this is this is sort of aimed at, at um, this is one I'm teeing up for Alex and Una. So the way you guys discuss stable coins um, sort of pre-imagines that they're all corporate forms where there's uh, well, Una talked about ones that weren't or didn't have a, an address, but there are stable coins that actually don't have a common reserve under management. They're, they're DAOs, they're decentralized, uh, autonomous organizations that um, artificially manage the reserves. And one of them, one of them, I read their paper and tried to understand how they did it. Um, and, and it trades and it's got a cap of over $9 billion, which of course isn't anywhere near the size of Bitcoin or um, some of the other big ones, but those aren't stable coins either. But you, there are stable coins out there that aren't the way we're, you were describing them, Alex. They don't have financial statements. They, they don't have a reserves in a bank or a cus, cus, custodial. Somehow the reserves are all managed on the internet with some sort of set of uh, smart contracts. Um, are you okay with those or, or does your stable coin and, and maybe Una, does it have to be a, a corporate form with an address, with, a, with somebody you can haul into court and with financial statements and accountants and Charlie, you may wanna weigh in on this too. Una, you wanna go ahead or? Um, well, I think just to comment on the structure, first of all, it's the founders of these decentralized ones that set the whole precedent um, through the smart contracts that are responsible for running the, the stable coin or whatever it is that they produce. Uh, said that they don't do this and they don't do that. The problem is that you don't really know. You have no way of knowing. And actually, I think for subsequent um, holders in the day organization, they have to abide by the existing, um, the existing principles, the existing contracts that might be changed by a vote as I think you yourself mentioned, with people who are not necessarily expert in, in finances. 
And to me, there would be first the accountability question. And then I think the important point to remember, and that's why I put it in the title of my book, is for this to gain any real leverage, any real prospects of growth, there is the question of trust. And why should I trust something? I know people do, but mainly through FOMO perhaps. Uh, I know people trust something, can put their trust in it, but I don't see how that trust can be sustained. That's my problem with it. Somebody, uh, Paul, somebody is writing uh, the code which run, makes the thing run. Uh, it, if, if there are assets or so-called reserves, uh, they're owned somehow. Uh, I, I think, as I said to you uh, yesterday, I think, Paul, this makes me think of the, of the ideology uh, of mutual organizations. When you, when you read that, uh, the descriptions of what they're doing, it makes me think a lot of, of mutual organizations and the, and the progressive uh, um, theory of them in the early 20th century, that the customers of the organization uh, are the owners and and uh, so they presumably the, the customers of the Deo are, are th as intermediated by the system, the owners of whatever assets it owns. But uh, it is very, uh, it, if they're all controlling the system together, it's, it strikes me as not an innovation in the form of money, especially if it's tied to the dollar as a stable value, but, an, but a, an attempted innovation in organizational form. Um, these decentralized autonomous organizations clearly are um, new. Um, and, and because they're new and very bizarre to people like us that are used to thinking about corporations and financial statements and accountings and lawyers, they're, they're not fitting in very well. Um, and, uh, you know, the, if they pay interest, which you, Alex, suggest, if it's going to be viable, it's going to have to pay interest. And Charlie says it's like a, it's like a, uh, preferred share, maybe that, that, that makes it a security and, and not necessarily a bank, bank charter. Um, I mean, I've written elsewhere that, um, stable coins look a whole lot like a, stable value ETF uh, and, and maybe they should be treated that way, which is kind of along the lines that, that um, Charlie's saying, except he doesn't, maybe he doesn't even want the, I mean, you can't, you don't refund an ETF share, you have to trade it on the market. So they're not really refundable, although the manager of it can do it. So is, what, what, do, what do you guys think about that? And is that a bank? Or is it a is it is it a is it a security under the Investment Company Act like an ETF? Can, can um, I just, Charlie, maybe, yeah, if I maybe, can just spell it out more clearly so everybody's understanding what I'm saying. So imagine on the right hand side of this company, um, all the coins, what you might call coins, stable coins, are just perpetual preferred shares, and the company also has common stock. That, uh, but that that's not the coins. The coins are the perpetual preferred shares. On the asset side, it starts off with cash assets that it, the proceeds from the sale of its coins are cash assets, um, and the proceeds from the sale of its common stock are cash. And so it starts off with cash, and it uses that cash to back up its commitment to buying and selling the coins in the secondary market. And as we know, there's platforms for doing that. So that you buy whenever their price gets to 99.5 and you sell whenever their price is 100.5 and that's gonna keep them stable valued. Um, there is no redeemability, there is no maturity, there is no debt. Um, this is pretty simple. Uh, we're using things we're very familiar with, perpetual preferred stock, secondary market transaction commitments, algorithmically committed to. This isn't that complicated. And what why I love it, why is that a is, bank? Why is that a bank and not a security? I didn't say I didn't say it's a bank. I mean, okay. I don't I don't want to get hung up on 
it's a, it's a payment, I would call it a bank in the sense that it is a payment system delivery technology. Um, and so since bank is defined by function, I would say that's a bank, traditional banking function. So I'd call it a bank, but it's not issuing anything like a deposit or a historical bank note or anything like that. And it doesn't need to. And in fact, it's much more stable and much more dependable because it doesn't. <laughs> so uh, I don't see why this is so difficult. I think it's pretty obvious that this could work. Um, and I, I don't I, think it's, yeah. I don't think it's difficult and I agree with you, but I just wonder where it fits in and in the current regulatory structure. I think it would be, these would be securities. The, both the common stock and the perpetual preferred would be securities. They'd have to be regulated securities. I would have this chartered by the OCC because it, it, its algorithms could then be examined to ensure that they did all the things I said they should and that its, its books could be reviewed to make sure that it was honestly reported its accounting of its cash assets in particular. How does so this thing make money, Charlie? How does this thing make money as you've described? Uh, now, the main way it makes money is two different things. One is the spread that it earns um, uh, because it's holding, so it's, it's holding cash assets, let's call those treasury bills, and it, its dividends on its preferred um, are, would, would be lower, presumably, so it would make repay its physical cost of operation through that spread. And then furthermore, and this is the really important point, that the future of these uh, of blockchain payments has to do with messaging, not just payments flows, but actual messages that accompany them and you charge a fee. There is a big uh, uh, intangible asset that's gonna be owned by this having to do with its network capabilities for transmitting messages. And it's gonna charge for those messages fees. So these intermediaries, I didn't invent this idea. This is going to happen. There's no question. It's been it's already been patented multiple ways. So this is what the future of payment systems is, where you don't just say, I want to send money. You say, I want to send money to someone. And I want to, in a limited way, reveal information to them simultaneous with the receipt of the payment in real time at the speed of light. That's where we're headed. That's going to happen unless our politicians stop it. No, Charlie, don't the new protocols that were adopted for the, the bank the payment systems, haven't they expanded the messaging uh, size so that they that you can actually do that in the banking system now as well? Well, again, you know, you mentioned the JP Morgan technology. Look, I, I mean, it's possible that the banks could adopt this. I noticed they're adopting it under some pressure coming from these guys. Uh, I don't think JP Morgan, that big behemoth organization, is uh, some sort of economic efficiency model. And I guess that if they had to actually pit themselves against the unbundled versions of this and all the other functions banks perform, they wouldn't survive. Um, you know, when people from these banks come to my courses at Columbia to explain where their comparative advantages are, when they're honest, they, they tend to admit that their government charter and their relationship with government is at the core of why they keep surviving. I, I think we just need to deal with this issue that that these organizations are powerful they survive because of their partnership with the government they're not economically efficient and if they had to go up against these other competitors they wouldn't survive does anybody want to weigh I'll in predict, i'll predict right now charlie in line with your own thinking that these other competitors will themselves be all entangled with the government I can't argue too much against your view there, but my, if you notice, one of my pieces of advice is to form a political coalition that favors consumer efficiency focus, to try to use our new technology to reinvent our politics so that it's not just special interests that govern everything. And I'm not, I, I, I'm not saying it's gonna be easy, Alex, but I think that's where, where we have to go. I also want to just slip in one comment, which is Alex was pessimistic about whether we could also create a private unit of account separate from the dollar. And I do believe that is feasible, especially using Irving Fisher's idea of bundles of goods and services as the implicit numeraire. 
It, it could be done with the current technology where you are executing payments. So you're observing a lot of things that, from which you can construct bundles. So in the digital, hey, you could do it. I fully agree. You can do it if you tie them to a clear asset. I was describing a, the equivalent of a fiat currency, which has no asset, no cash flow. No, but that's what I think I'm saying. <laughs> I'm saying that you could create a unit of account separate from the dollar without tying it to the dollar that would still be as yeah, but it to, could be tied. It would still have to be tied to assets. Um, it would have right. to be tied to. It, That's the really radical thing about Bitcoin. I think is is it isn't it isn't tied to any asset. No, I agree. Cash. It's it's tied to. So some that's kind what of that's what I think. Yeah, it could be right. as tied that's to. That's what I think can good. never serve as a money. Yeah. Oh, okay. I agree completely. But I'm just saying, you know, in the deep distant future, I think we could get there. So, um, and and then finally, just about digital currency, I, I just want to really agree with all that you said about its dangers. And just add to that, that part of the, the pressure to do it is to create a political alternative to stable coins to try to pretend that we're doing something progressive, innovative, and wonderful for consumers so that we don't have to give them what they really want, which is a good technology. I think the interesting point though is why do the stable coins move from the Bitcoin um, structure to one in which they look to something else which would inspire trust and that was a fiat currency mostly some have turned to gold and other precious metals other sorts of assets and whether they do that through an algorithm or the one-to-one -one exchange that was where they the only way that they could see they would go could go to inspire confidence i, I agree a hundred percent with that yeah. So, so then I don't see where else they can go. Remember that trust is an important point of a currency and what we do with a currency. We pay each other for goods and services of all kinds. Why do we exchange bits of colored paper with each other, less so now, or transfer amounts of these bits of paper to each other digitally? We do it because we trust that that person is going to accept it in payment for our goods and services and not dispute the agreed price that we had already paid. Now, I don't see how an entirely private currency is going to inspire the same sort of trust. You suggested bundling. I'm not quite sure you what bundled, but this could actually be going back to something even farther back in history, and that's bartering. And you would have to have, if it was a, really a kind, of, a kind of bartering that was exchanged digitally and not deciding whether or not your hen was worth a cow or not. <laughs> it's, it's the way Can I come back to the forms of uh, uh, money here? If you look at the... Uh, um, uh, central bank digital currency paper just put out by the Federal Reserve, a very careful paper taking no positions to speak of. Uh, but one of the things that's raised in there is that there would be for the central bank currency an intermediary whose only asset would be central bank deposits and would in effect pass on a collateralized a deposit to the public. I say it this way: collateralized by the uh, by the central bank deposit. Now, this this is uh, very close to what in the 1930s you mentioned uh, Irving Fisher, Charlie. What Irving Fisher called 100% money, which is you put uh, uh, you put you create a private intermediary. But to, but to the extent it has a deposit, its only asset is a claim on the central bank. Uh, obviously, the central bank would totally control uh, the uh, fortunes of such intermediaries. But there's another organizational idea in this rather interesting mix. I just want to clarify that I'm talking about 
the the idea of a unit of account, which was the issue you raised when when talking about yeah. Herbie Fisher, and that yeah. his point, just to, to make make it clear, if if we know that, let's say all of us are consuming a particular bundle of commodities, um, it would be very easy to then denominate that bundle, the particular proportion of things we consume, those commodities, at, that is in at least in theory deliverable, to denominate that to make that the unit yes. of account for our system. And yes. the point and is, I think, Charlie, you can I think do that's that. very much I think that's very much the sort of thing that Hayek had in mind when he was writing about the competitors. Uh, with the central bank currency that might be created. And I agree that is possible. I think, I think we could do it. And in fact, all the more possible if you have a way to algorithmically track the particular uh, things that people are buying and selling so that you can then talk about uh, those, those things and their value in real time. So I, I think it's, it's actually where the world would go um, eventually. Now, the, the other thing to just say here, it's very hard to climb out of our own era. Um, you know, we're in the modern era, which starts, let's say, sometime in the 1600s, where central banks evolved from banks of issue with these monopoly rights that Alex talked about. We've had about 400 years of the evolution of that, uh, 200 years of a fairly stable version of it. I don't think that's where humanity's headed. I don't think central banks will be with us forever. I hope not. Charlie, can we, can we get a little more concrete with your bundling? So the CPI is an in, is a price index or an index of, of, a, of, a, of a fairly fixed bundle month to month. How would you, how would you, what would be your unit of, of account if based on the CPI? Is it, how does that work exactly? It, it's the weighted, uh, each of the components weighted based on how, how much people consume of each is the ideal. Uh, and I think Fisher was the one that, use the word the ideal unit or something like that so that you would construct the the unit of value based on the actual combination of things that people consume because then it would have inherently yeah. inherent okay. stability okay i'm trying to so let's let's say we do this and we start and the C, we we index the, that bundle that there's a cbi to one and next month some prices go up what happens to the unit of account the next month so prices go up some amount and so that bundle in in would somehow how does how does oh, no it's like it's the physical weights in which they're consumed weights. it's the physical weights of the consumption of each element that determines its weight in the bundle now you could have a bundle that evolves over time there's no problem with doing that but it, it really the ideal bundle is is what people are consuming in fact you could even imagine having location specific bundles location specific units of account where people would find it advantageous from a value stability standpoint to have different units of account in different cities even. Uh, or so, the, so the idea is I work an hour and um, I want payment in that bundle and, um, and there's no inflation if I just, if that the amount, amount of bun, my, my, I, how does I'm, I get paid the same so the, bundle? Yeah, so, I mean, the tricky thing is that you want to have the settlement of obligations denominated in the bundle to be able to be done in ways other than the actual bundle. That's where it gets a little tricky, but that's where the coins, as long as the coins are uh, credible in, in you know, having um, uh, the, the administration of them transparent and all the rest of it, we could be confident that we could find a way. This is not something we're ready to do tomorrow, Paul. But it's the point is there's no th theoretical obstacle to getting rid of fiat currency and even getting rid of gold based currency and having uh, the unit of account be determined by a bundle of commodities or services that um, the, the, there are some tricky things about how do you actually get delivery of this and how do you think about um, who defines it exactly and so these are things, that's why I said 50 years, not, not five years. And for There's a large the theoretical <laughs> obstacle, however, it's also reality. It's called the state and yes. its desire. That's the problem. That's why Hayek and Fisher and others uh, were writing a long time ago and nothing's happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we're, we're coming to our hard stop. And unfortunately, 
I'm going to have to do my taxes pretty soon and support that nasty state. <laughs> that really bad things to us, um, as I guess some of you will too. So thank you very much for the panelists. And it was a very interesting discussion. And um, I'm sure we'll continue this at some point in the future since these issues won't go away. Thanks for watching. Thank, thanks to all. Oh, thank you. Very much. <laughs> Bye.